Bear Down Bears fans, Pat the Designer, Jason McKee, back for another episode of the Chicago Bears podcast. Listen, interesting episode today because the Bears staff is complete. They made two hires, one hire under the cover of darkness. Who's signing these contracts at 3 a.m.? Dog, what's going on here? Like I was I was in bed, knocked out when the running backs coach gets uh, uh, hired for the Bears, but Got to talk about that. Got to talk about also bringing in a new pass game coordinator. Very interesting name there as well. And just the outlook of this team overall with the NFC North keeping Ben Johnson. I think that was yesterday's biggest surprise. We'll talk about all that more on today's episode of the Chicago Bears podcast. Hit that like button. Subscribe to the page. Leave that five-star review. J-Mac, what's going on, my guy? Yeah, man. Just, uh, you know, everything, man. Football. Football in high school, college recruiting is in full effect. So, uh, we've had a lot, a ton of schools come to come to visit and, and look at our players. We had about 17 schools last week. Uh, that's picking up this week as well. So, you know, just like you were saying, you know, the Bears make a hire at three in the morning. You said you were asleep, but hey, football is 365. You know, there is it's it's always work, man. It's always work. So, you know, the teams never sleep. The organizations they never sleep. They're always trying to gain a competitive edge. So. It just goes to show you why Ryan Poles has a, you know, a bed up there at Hallis Hall because he's always working. He's down in Mobile right now evaluating the senior bowl, you know, along with a large Bears contingent down there, you know, evaluating players, trying to find a way to make their roster better, trying to find a way to get atop the NFC North, trying to find a way to get to the playoffs, something that we haven't, you know, we haven't experienced in a long time. And it sucks when you see, you know, your counterparts, you know, you see in, in Detroit, you know, playing in the playoffs and, you know what happened there, but hey, they made it to the playoffs. Hey, so, hey, you know it, it's it works never stop. You you got to be on your p's and q's. You got to find the right fits and hires. And and if you're not up working while your opponent's sleeping, well, guess what? Your opponent's gonna get ahead. And that's the name of this game. And that's the way the NFL works. Yeah, the Senior Bowl going on right now. A lot of the bear, a lot of Bears came from the Senior Bowl last year. I believe five of our draft picks were from yeah. the Senior Bowl last year. So very interesting to see what's going to come out of it this year. Hope that we can find some nice pieces. I saw some nice offensive line play down there. Little Jackson Powers at center. You know what I mean, I like what I'm seeing from some of these guys down there. Let's start it off here, though, uh, uh, J Mac. Let's start it off with some of the hires that the Chicago Bears have made. I think. An interesting one to me, right? And we haven't gotten a chance to talk about this as much, but with the senior bowl, Kirby Joseph is down there and he had his thoughts on what an elite quarterback in the NFL is going to look like. And I thought that this was a great, a great place because this is our quarterbacks coach. This is the guy that we look to, to develop quarterbacks. And the things he said, I guess my question to you is how many of these does Justin Fields check off? Basically saying, here's uh, what he's looking for when he's evaluating the quarterback, arm talent, accuracy, delivery quickness, physical toughness, swagger. You got to have a little swag playing the quarterback position. And when I say that, I mean confidence. You got to have confidence. And I, I like to say arrogance, but arrogance to me, all it is is confidence under control. When right. you hear that, one, do you like the hire of, uh, Cur- I'm sorry, I said Kirby Joseph, Kerry Joseph yeah. to the Chicago Bears? And do you do you like how he's evaluating the quarterback? Does that sound like Justin Fields? Yeah, I think it, you know, it's when you look at the elite quarterbacks in this league, those are all characteristics and traits that they all have. And I think Justin Fields embodies a lot of those traits. Um, you look at, you know, you talk about the toughness, accuracy, arm strength, arm talent, you know, and I don't know. Did you say athleticism? I don't know if you said athleticism, but did not say athleticism. Arm talent, accuracy, delivery, quickness, physicality, toughness, and swagger yeah. were the ones. But he has all of those things. He has the swagger. The one thing I'd say that you know he would have to work on, and and quarterbacks they're all going to have things they need to work on, even if they embody all those characteristics that you mentioned and that Coach Joseph talked about, is uh you know giving the ball out quicker. You know, and, and that's one thing that. I think he'll have to work on. But when you look at it and what we saw with this offense last year too, Pat, I think that's, yes, it's Justin, but it's also the system. So a lot of times when we saw five-man protections, right, a protection in which that ball should come out quick just because you have five guys in protection, a lot of times we saw deeper out. So there was no side adjustment. There was no hot routes by the receivers. So that ball couldn't come out quick. And you've seen Justin back there patting that ball. But then there yeah. were times when, 
You know, he had a clear, decisive read in which there was a receiver wide open and that ball should have came out quick and he didn't, you know, he didn't get rid of it. So I think that's, you know, have, Justin has to work on that, but you also have to have a coach that's going to develop that and bring that up out of Justin as well. And, you know, my biggest thing is is uh, with Justin, his entire time here is, you know, the, the type of teaching and development, you know, w- that he was getting. And that's something that we don't know because we weren't in that quarterback room, but, you know, how stern were they on the on the fundamentals, the daily fundamentals, the EDD, the everyday drills that they do in practice? Like how you know, stern they got pills for EDD now. Huh? I said they got pills for EDD now. now. That's what you call it as a coach, EDD. Oh, everyday okay. Drills. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's coach. That's coach talk. But when but it's like as a coach, right? You can't overlook basic fundamentals. You can't overlook things like if your quarterback's making mistakes and he's lacking in basic fundamentals that you know that's necessary for him to be successful. You've got to overcoach that. You've got to harp on that. You've got to hold them accountable. And that's one thing that that remained in question with this entire team that we talked about all season was the accountability and upholding these players to a high level of accountability. So, you know, I think Justin embodies all those things. Yes, we know he's got the swag. And I like what he said, like swag. And, yeah, you know, Justin comes out there wearing the orange cleats and stuff like that. But we ain't talking about swag like that. We're talking about swag in terms of his confidence. And I think Justin's a real confident guy because of the abilities and traits that he has. I think he just needs somebody, a quarterback coach, offense coordinator, to help bring those 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 traits and that skill set out of him on a consistent basis. You know yep. what I'm saying? I think that's something that's been lacking his entire time here. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of these things that Justin Fields does embody as a player. I think the the one part, like you said, the the delivery quickness, right? Processing yeah. the field as quickly as possible, realizing when you need to make a decision. I, I we said during the season, right, when Justin Fields got hurt holding the football too long, it's because you were holding the football too long. You didn't make a decision. You didn't make a decision to get out of the pocket. So I I, I agree with you that he embodies a lot of these. It, it'll be interesting to see as he's evaluating some of the quarterbacks down at the Senior Bowl and some of the quarterbacks who are up here uh, uh, in the draft and different things like that, if he sees somebody who's maybe a little bit further along there. Another one we got yesterday, which I thought was a very, very good hire for the Chicago Bears, was Thomas Brown. I thought that this was one of the biggest hires they could have made. The Bears actually interviewed Thomas Brown as their offensive coordinator uh, before they end up hiring him as their pass game coordinator, which First off, genius, right? Just interview all of these guys, find guys you like, and then when you hire your OC, you go, we also have this guy who we interviewed, and we think he'd fit perfect with you, especially with Shane Waldron already in place. And these guys work together with the Rams. I believe uh, both of them were on the staff together when the Rams did win the Super Bowl. Um, Thomas Brown was an assistant head coach at that point. He was also the tight ends coach at that point. Took the OC role down in Carolina. And I'm not going to lie to you, J-Mac. I don't hold nothing against him in Carolina. It wasn't working for Frank Wright. Frank Wright basically said, it ain't working. You take over, get some experience, call in plays. This season's a wash, boys. (laughs) And it got a little bit better, but like, the team had no O-linemen, a struggling small quarterback, and your number one wide receiver was Adam Thielen. I didn't have a lot of expectations for Thomas Brown down there. I think this is a great way to build a coaching ladder here in Chicago. You got Shane Waldron in place. If he develops a QB, Thomas Brown is still there because he's going to be gone. If you develop a QB in Chicago, you've yeah. got a job for yeah. 10 years plus probably yeah. just off of that. I mean, Adam Gase got two coaching positions off of kind of developing Jay Cutler. Like, I I, I think that yeah. when you look at what the Bears are building here, they're building, to me, an elite succession plan. And I like what I'm seeing with the hire of Thomas Browns. What were your thoughts when you saw him uh, yeah. be added to this Bears coaching tree? I was excited because, you know, Thomas is a former player. You know, he was a draft pick uh, by the Cleveland Browns, played running back at the University of Georgia, really good running back. And, and you know, we look at coaches, you look at what they've gone through and where they've coached at to get to where they are, right? And obviously his ultimate pinnacle was last year being the offensive coordinator and now him being the pass game coordinator here. You know, he's a coach that, that I say, like, he took the stairs to get to where he's at. You know what I mean? He took levels. So, Started off as, as uh, Georgia strength and conditioning coach, didn't want to coach at uh, Chattanooga. He coached at Marshall. He coached at yeah. uh, Miami, uh, where he was uh, the University of Miami, where he was the running back coach and the offensive coordinator. Uh, but and he also coached running backs at Wisconsin, in which Melvin Gordon had had, had that electric year 
uh, back in, I think it was 2004, uh, 2014 at the University of Wisconsin. So here's a guy who's had success everywhere he's been, right? But he's had to earn it. He's had to take steps every at every single uh, level to get to where he's at. And he, and he has a wealth of knowledge, right? They, the thing, the words that we hear when, when people talk about Thomas Brown is, you know, he's a creative offensive mind. You know, he's he's really good with mentoring players. He's had a lot of players. He's coached. Yes, he's coached running backs. He's coached tight ends. So it's not like he's just pigeonholed as just a running back coach. Yeah. He's coached various positions, you know, on the offensive side of the ball. But also, like you said, Pat, the familiarity with him and Coach uh, Waldron, their time at the Rams, and we bring in another coach, right, that has a high mental IQ of, of the game of football in terms of offense, but a coach that's been on a staff that's won a Super Bowl, right? And we talk about this all the time, right? You talk about success and we talk about quarterback developers and this and that, right? Well, how do you know what six, how can you be successful if you don't know what success looks like or you haven't been around a staff or, or an organization that's had success, right? Yeah. How can you, how can you tell your players what it takes to get to a Super Bowl if you haven't been on a staff that's won a Super Bowl? It's, it's yeah. kind of hard, you know what I mean? It's kind of hard. So you bring a guy in who's been on a, a great staff that's won a Super Bowl that had a great quarterback like Matthew Stafford at the time that had a great year when the Rams won, won the Super Bowl. A guy who can, yeah, who has, yeah, he's going to be a good pass game coordinator, but a guy who could have been a head coach as well, right? And as a coach, as a head coach, the biggest asset to you that you can have is when you have a bunch of coaches in the room, right, that have great minds that are on the same level as you in terms of coaching and development and learning, right? Because a lot of those guys could have been head coaches that that's in the room now, but now they're helping to rebuild, to revamp, to revitalize this offense. And, you know, it, it's, it's a great hire by the bears because this guy I think is going to bring, you know, a different element. Um, you know, he's a younger guy. He's only 37. So I think yeah. he's going to relate to the players more. Yeah. Um, I think the players are going to respect him more because he was a player. And, uh, you know, I think we're, we're going to get, we're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of changes and hopefully for the better in terms of what we see from this bears offense next year. Bears also add Chad Morton in as their run game coordinator, which gets me, uh, or I'm sorry, the running backs coach, which gets me so excited because like you talked about, players in the room that have done this before, players in the room that have been a part of successful systems. He was over there with Waldron in uh, uh, Seattle as well, so you know that they already have that dynamic. If I'm going to rehire with you, that means we probably work well together. Um, this is a, this is probably one of the more important ones to me, though, because the knock on Shane Waldron is doesn't run the ball enough. There's a lot. Bringing in a similar run game coordinator to me speaks to you having maybe a similar philosophy and having guys in the building that are okay with that philosophy. I like the hire of Chad Morton to the Chicago Bears because I think we we saw the running backs in Seattle get better while still being utilized more in spot situations, right? Whenever they put the ball in their hands, mm -hmm. they were really good. But does this to you speak to we're going to see a lot of the very same things we saw in Seattle where – I, I don't I don't know real percentages on this, but I'd say it was probably 75 to 25 percent past the run. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I, the good thing, I think. And, you know, the one thing that I question when when the Bears, you know, they let go of Coach Getze, but then they kept Coach Morgan and Coach yeah. Morgan, the old line coach for the Bears. They retained him and retained the tight end coach. I mean, Coach Morgan's a great offensive line coach. Like mm -hmm. he, he knows what he's doing. And, and you look at how high the Bears have ranked in rushing the last two years. Right. That's one thing. Right. That's not been a dark cloud over this offense has been the run game. So, you know, the fact that the Bears retain Coach Morgan just shows you how valuable he is to this organization and to this offense. So you bring a guy who, you know, Coach Waldron, who they say doesn't run the ball and struggled running the ball in Seattle and you pair him with Coach Morgan. And like I said, you know, as a coach or coordinator or head coach, the thing, like I said, your biggest asset is having guys in the room that are experts in their field, right? That have had success in their field. And that's one thing that Coach Morgan has had. He's had success in the run game. And you look at the type of success he's had, despite despite Pat Wright, we've seen so many different offensive line combinations, right? But the productivity still remained the same. We still rank in the upper echelon of the NFL in terms of running the ball. So that just shows you how good a coach Coach Morgan is. Despite who's in there, he's making sure those guys are ready to go out there and, and, and are prepared to be physical and, and to put a good running game on display. So, you know, I, I'm interested to see how this, this new passing game is going to be married to the run game. 
You know yeah. what I mean? When I say that, it's it's you know the elite teams in this league. You know what they what they've been doing is, and if you look at these teams, right, these offenses, right, they're having a lot of success because like the 49ers, right. They'll show you a run look. They'll have two tight ends, three tight ends in there. They'll have, you know, Kyle, you check the fullback in there. And you're thinking, hey, you know, this is a run down. This is a run down. But what do you know, right? Play action to Christian McCaffrey. They get the ball out to all those weapons they have. You know, and they're keeping the defense on their toes. So when you have that continuity to where you can marry the, the pass and run game you're, and you're confusing defenses and they're seeing formations in which you've had success running the football out of those formations, right? And they're thinking it's a sure bona fide run, and then you come out and you're and you're throwing that football. Well, guess what? You you're dictating the tempo to the defense. You're gaining an advantage, and I that's one thing that I would like to see here in Chicago. You know, can we truly marry the run and pass game? And I think that's something that we we weren't able to do last year. It was, yeah. we, you know, we ran the ball well, and then we sucked at passing. Like the the concept didn't match the protection and all that stuff. So you know, having Coach Morgan still here and bringing in Wall and. Ty- Thomas Brown, like, I think it's awesome to have those guys in the building to to really, you know, tie in this offense as a whole. Yeah, I mean, the, and I think that they're – I'm excited about the staff because it's it to me is the perfect mix of former players and guys who have been, you know, successful coaches in the league. I look at Chad Morton coming in. It's not like he's just a, a, a guy who didn't see any time on the field. Some of the records that he holds – yeah, we got record holders in the building here, J-Mac. Most yeah. kickoff returns for touchdown in a single Ooh. game. Did that in 2002 versus the Buffalo Bills. Longest yeah. overtime kickoff returned for a touchdown, 96 yards in 2002 versus the Buffalo Bills. Most yeah. receptions in a playoff game by a rookie. Had 13 when he played for the Saints. And most receptions in a playoff game. He's tied with three others for that 13. Um, yeah. When you see guys that come in the building with accolades to their name. Now, it's not that... Right. He has this illustrious NFL career. He's a Hall of Famer and different things like that. But having that experience to be able to bring to the guys that are already in the building, having that understanding and being able to say, listen, I've done this. I've been in these roads. I understand what we need to do to get this done. Follow me and we'll be able to do that even on a assistant coaching level, like running backs coach, being able to come in and do that. That to me speaks to the Chicago Bears starting to do things a little bit differently. Not to say they haven't had former players in the building, but I almost feel like they've shied away from the former players that have been very successful in the NFL, if you, if you want to say that, right? Like Chico, of course, was our, our DC when you guys were there, and, and Chico has had the ultimate success in the NFL. But outside of that, we really haven't had a ton of coaches on this Bears staff throughout the years that have had really good success in the NFL. I like seeing that we're willing to go with guys who have been successful in this league and, and are trying to bring that success to what we're currently doing. Yeah, 100 percent. And you talked about Chad Morton and all those accolades. And, you know, I had the opportunity my days playing here in Chicago. You know, our running back coach with Tim Spencer, who played in the NFL, um, you know, he played in the NFL, played for the uh, the Chargers and stuff like that. And and the fact that, you know, he had been in the trenches, you know, he's been through it. Uh, it was better than just the X's and O's with him. You know, we he was like a, a, a mentor, a big brother figure for us to where, you know, that relationship was super strong. And it's still strong to this day. You know what I mean? We go and hang out and we go talk football. We, you know, he helps me, uh, gives me advice about high school football. Like that relationship is so strong because he cared about us as people and not just players. And I think mm-hmm. when you can show a player that you care about him as a person and it's not, not just a player, you're going to get the most out of them. They trust you. So guess what? They're going to give their all for you. And, and when you have a guy like that, who's been through, who's been through the trenches you know, who's fought to make rosters and stuff like that, and he's giving you the real, you got to respect that. And like I said, it's another hire in which, you know, we talked about Thomas Brown. You know, you talk about Chad Morton, a young guy that yeah. can relate to these players. I mean, these players are different. They're young. You know, I'm on the road with these guys every game, and it's it's different. You know, I mean, they're different, different minds. And, and you know, guys, you know, they're motivated differently. You got to know your player. And if you don't know your player, well, how are you going to get the most out of them? And you look at this Bears running back, you look at the running back coach the past four years, it's been a different coach every year. I mean, yeah. one year was Charles London, then you had Michael Petrie, then David Walker, and bam, now you insert Omar Young. You know what I mean? There's got to be some continuity in that running back room. You know what I mean? You got some young backs 
Khalil Herbert, Rashawn Johnson. Like, you've got young backs. You know what I mean? Dante yeah. Foreman's still a young back, and, you know, that's up in the air whether or not he'll be back. But, you know, we'll probably draft another running back. you got young backs. And it's as a rookie, as a running back coming into this league, it's different. It's different than college. You know, the game's different. The game's faster. You know what I mean? Some of these guys, they played at elite level schools, but guess what? You're not lining up against Southeast, West Kentucky, Missouri State. You're lining up against the Green Bay Packers. You know what I mean, Pat? Like, you better you better know what you're doing. And what school was that? What school was that? East, West Kentucky, Kansas State. And you know, you, you can't. The funny thing is there's so many schools now, Pat, and I try not to disrespect any of them. So I try to throw in a lot of different directions. Yeah, you throw them all in there. You, you throw, throw them all in there. The yeah. Whole, you put the whole compass in there. I, I, the I like that. I like that. <laughs> you see what I'm saying, Pat? But, like, you, if you don't have – Right. If you don't have that coach that can give you the real right. And and the coaches that I that I really respected the most, that was genuinely they were they were real to me. They told me exactly where I stood. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, you know what? You need to work on this. Otherwise, you're not going to make that roster. You need to be better in pass protection. You're not going to make that roster. Right. They can they can tell me those things, but it can also help develop me and coach me on, on how to get better at those things. Yeah. Those are the coaches that I that I respected the most, and I'll say it for the players as well. Those are the coaches that players respect, right? Because honesty is key. I don't want a coach that's just blowing smoke up my behind and telling me this, and, and knowing and he knows that you know I'm not really good at one aspect of my game. But yeah. he, that's not coaching. Our job as coaches is to develop players to help you learn to make sure you understand. We got to be great teachers. If you don't have a great teacher uh, in any of these rooms, or as a coordinator, or as a head coach, you're not going to be a great team. Because let's look at it like this: despite all the draft capital that we have, Pat, despite all the money we have, is and, and you know, in free agency and stuff like that, you're still going to have guys that you have to bring in here undrafted, guys who you aren't expecting to count on, who's going to get an opportunity to play a big role for your team uh, throughout the season. And if you're not coaching those guys, if you're not developing those guys, well, guess what? When that starter goes down and that backup comes in, it's going to be a huge drop off, right? Yeah. And you see, and you see, Pat, the teams that are great in this league. And I hate saying it. I hate talking about that team up north, but they they've done it consistently, right? Every single time you see one of those guys go down, they insert somebody else, and bam, you have a new star. You have a new star. We saw it with the wide receiver room this year. Like, who are these guys? Like, who is this guy? Christian Watson goes down, all the Packers are finished, right? Next thing you know, you got three or four receivers out there having big games. The development, the development is taking place on that practice field in the offseason on a daily basis so that way when those guys get an opportunity in which the organization knows they're going to get an opportunity because injuries are is going to happen in this league when those guys get a chance at their opportunity they're going to seize the day they're going to take advantage of it and there's not going to be a huge drop off and we'll still put ourselves in position to be successful and go to the playoffs and be our quote-unquote rival the chicago bears and we'll be in contention for the nfc north every single year because we have coaches that know how to develop and teach players. That's something that we haven't had here in Chicago. Yeah, and I think my favorite quote uh, from this season was when Tomlin was on, I want to say it was on the Pivot Podcast, Yeah, and he said, I love uh, hearing coaches resist the responsibility of coaching. Yes. When you sit there and you talk about guys coming out, and I, I think about this even with Justin Fields and things like that, right? We talk about all the plays Justin can't make, how he can't do this, how he can't do that, how he can't, right? Like, okay, well, can Caleb can. Like, that's just natural to him. Like, he's not going to need any coaching when he comes. No, he's going to need to still be coached up. And so you need a coach that's going to be in place at all of these positions that's going to say, it's not that he can't do it. He just hasn't figured out how to do it yet. That's a life lesson right there. Yeah, I mean, like he can, it's not that he can't do it. Yeah. He just ain't figured out how to do it yet. And I'm going to show him how to do it. I'm going to show him the route to do it. Some people, yeah, some people are going to resist that as a, as a player. There's a responsibility on both sides. But I like hearing that we have coaches that at least want to come into the building and coach. Yeah. yeah, and you have to. I mean, it's like like we talk about, right? Justin holds the ball too long. Well, what are we doing in practice, right, and schematically to get that ball out faster? In what did Greg practice? say? What did Greg say to us? He said, "He said I got a, I got a, court, a guy that develops quarterbacks. I'm not going to drop his name, but all they got to do is speed up his drop back." That's what I'm saying. Like and and like at practice, and I don't know. They may do this. They may. Right. I don't. You know, I'm not at practice all the time. But is there somebody that has a stopwatch, right, an internal clock? Hey, bam, ball should be out. 
uh, uh, ball should be out. You know what I mean? Is there a horn that goes off at practice when when he's holding that ball for five seconds? Man, that horn goes off, that ball should be out. We was there. It was not. <laughs> you know, yeah, kind of. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We didn't want to know. Me and Jay Mack were standing on the sideline going, sack, man, sack. Man, how many times we took sack. that? This is the same play, Come sack. On. I'm counting. Remember, Pat, I'm counting you. One, two. I'm one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Hey, giving them long Mississippis, too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that also goes to, right, if that's Justin, right? Yeah. But that's coaching, developing a, 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 a way to teach his quarterback, right, to get that ball out faster. But then what route concepts are you tying in to get that ball out fast, right? I mean, and, and then it's, it's, it's just a lot of things that tie into it, man. Like, it's you know, the quarterback, you have to understand what you're seeing schematically from the defense. And it's also knowing where I'm going with the ball, getting a pre-snap read and understanding, okay, this is what I'm seeing. I have rotation here. I like this in, in terms of what we call. And then the receivers, when they see certain coverages or leverages that, you know, defenders and defensive backs are playing on them, okay, is there a side adjustment? Is there a hot? Bam, Justin knows where the hot is. Bam, ball's out quick. You know what I'm saying? When you have that type of quarterback, that's been taught and developed to process at a high level, then you can go out there and execute at a high level. But if you have coaches that aren't developed, that don't have that, they're not teaching that quarterback, the quarterback's unsure in terms of what he's seeing, right? He doesn't understand. There's no there's no side adjustments or no hot routes by the receivers. Well, then guess what? You get a quarterback that's sitting back there patting the ball, playing patty cake with the ball. Yeah. I mean, that's what you get. Let me let me ask you this as somebody who's been in the building as somebody who's been in those trenches with the Chicago Bears and with how they're building this right now what about this feels different what about this feels like there's something that is happening now that wasn't happening before Honestly right now nothing I mean it's all we saw the same thing you know it's new coaches came in and you know we saw that last year new coaches come and go um but it still remains to be seen until they get out there, until they start working with each other, until they start devising, uh, you know, a, a, an offense schematically that fits the, the players that they have, we don't know. I mean, they're all great hires. They all have they all have credentials. They've all had have had success of where they've been at. But now we have to tie it in together, right? right. We have a lot of good chefs that that bring a lot of different ingredients. But how are we going to make this great meal? You know, how is this meal going to be a success? That remains to be seen. That's where the work comes in. You know what I mean? You still got guys. Coach Morgan still has to bond with Coach Waldron. You yep. know what I'm saying? And, 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 and they've got to all be on the same. Like, what does Coach Waldron want this identity to be offensively? Yep. And, his, and his coordinators and his position coaches have to be able to, to echo that down to their position groups. They have to be able to teach it that way. You know, what are we all going to call this? Okay. You know, Thomas, you guys call it this in, in Carolina. You know, Coach Morgan, you guys call this, you know, this uh, this run, this particular run uh, last year with, with Coach Getze, as Coach Walden, this is what we're going to call this. You know what I'm saying? We all have to be on the same page and make sure we're teaching the same things, making sure we're developing our, developing our players the same way in terms of the, the, how we want them to be able to execute our scheme. And, you know, that's where the work comes in. That's where the relationship bonding takes place. You know, those guys are, and I'm sure they've already been meeting. You know, even if some of those guys are down there in Mobile, I'm sure they're meeting down there. They're meeting through, mm -hmm. meeting in person, you know, trying to put together uh, the best offense, you know, the best scheme, regardless of who's under center. You know, they're trying to figure out a way to make this thing better. How can we get better in the passing game? How can we continue to be elite and get better in the run game? How do we tie all this together? Because there's a lot of different personalities, a lot of great wealth of football knowledge, but we still have to work together to create one product, to create one, an offense. That's either going to be tailored toward Justin or whatever other quarterback they bring here. But it's, it's got to be, you know, it's got to be tailored to, to what we have in terms of our personnel. Yeah, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see kind of what they end up doing, especially with a North now, an NFC North that we thought was going to be very, very different. I'm not going to lie. I thought the loss yeah. of Ben Johnson would have sent the Lions into a little bit of a different direction because, we can all we always say, right, you want to build the coaching tree, you want to build that coaching ladder, mm -hmm. but it doesn't always work that mm -hmm. way. And I didn't know if Ben Johnson was going to have that effect. It's not going to matter anyway, though, J Mac, because yeah. he announces yesterday that he is staying in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And that keeps Detroit to me 
kind of on the right path. That keeps Detroit to me moving in the right direction. I have a couple of things about this that uh, I feel do affect the Bears here outside of just, you know, him staying in the NFC North. But when you heard that yesterday that he was staying in Detroit, what was your thoughts with the Bears now? Does it feel like they're in a situation where they could be looking up at the division again with where the Packers are? They're standing pat with LaFleur and Love. You've got Goff and, and Johnson staying together as well, and we've got a new dynamic coming in. Yeah, I, I don't think it – I mean, I, it's going to be interesting, and that's just it's going to just – you know, it's going to show you that the NFC North is going to be one of the strongest divisions in football just because of the continuity, you know, with Detroit and, and Green Bay. You know, the Minnesota Vikings are kind of in the same in the same situation we are. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't worried about the Vikings. You know what I mean? Yeah. But but you look at it like this, right, with, with, with Coach Johnson staying there in Detroit, like offensively, they were already ahead of us because of the weapons that they had. Yep. But I'm, I'm saying this to say this, right? the familiarity in terms of the offense is there. So the players, they have an understanding of, of the offense as a whole right now. Detroit oh, yeah. to make some changes. They're going to go back and review tape and find ways to make themselves better. You know, uh, Coach Campbell may get a, you know, he may have to find somebody to help him with decision-making and stuff like that. But offensively, like, they're not going to have to learn a whole new system, right? They'll make changes to make, to make things better. The continuity will still be there. Like the players are already used to Coach Johnson and those position coaches. They're yeah. continuing to build that strong relationship. But now they get an opportunity to build upon what they've started. But not only build upon that, it gives them motivation, right, to, to try to finish the job that they did not this year. So and, and you look at the Bears against Troy. We should have beat them twice. I mean, we saw what happened in the first game. The come out, and, then, and then we whooped their tail here when they came to Chicago. So, you know, I'm not going to say that we're on the bottom looking up. I say we're right in the mix, but we have to get it right. We have to get it right, Pat. And and that just goes with the offense. We got to get the offense right. The defense has some things they need to, you know, uh, to correct. And, you know, the coaches know, like, it's a battle. Like, like we talked about when we first started the pod, right? It's continuing to find a competitive edge as, as an organization, right? We've got to be the best at everything we do. Everything we do, every decision we make has to give us a competitive edge against the opponents in our division, but against any opponent that we will face. Right now, we're starting with coaching, right? It's going down there and it's going on down there in Mobile. The Senior Bowl with those scouts, they've got to, you know, take every single note. They've got to evaluate these players when they're leaving the football field. They got You got to evaluate them in interviews because you have to get it right. Every decision we make from here on out, regardless if it's a first round draft pick, pick a uh, first round player that we drafted, to an undrafted free agent. We've got to bring guys in here that understand what our culture is, they understand what our philosophy is, they understand what our identity is, they understand what it means to be a Chicago Bear. But that's up to the head coach and the GM to make sure that when they're interviewing these these players, right, and, and when, they, when, when they're bringing in these coaches, that everybody's on the same page. And that's how you gain that competitive edge. And if you're not doing that, well, guess what? You know, we'll be a, a team that's, that's watching the playoffs again, just like we have been the last few years. I'm not going to lie. The first thing that I thought uh, when I saw that Ben Johnson was sticking around was that Ryan Poles knows what he's doing and we need to sometimes shut up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because in my mind, right, the the one thing that with us retaining Flus is there were better coaches to me out there. We're looking at Bill Belichick. We're looking at Vrabel. We're looking at Ben Johnson. We're looking at Jim Harbaugh, right? I still think you could have picked up the phone and called Harbaugh. Just, just get a no. That's all I want. Just get a no. Like, yeah, you ain't never called a girl up, and she'd be like, nah. Yeah, oh, okay. Hey, right. hey, yeah, coach, man, did, you, no. did you call Jim Harbaugh? No. 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 Did you call him? No. We ain't even talked to him. I, I got flu. Jim Harbaugh? No. No. He's a fucking Michigan. <laughs> I was like, damn. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe Ryan doesn't take rejection well. But uh yeah. I just I yeah. I the one thing that I thought though was your back's not against the wall coaching wise next year. Ben Johnson is still available next year. Bill Belichick doesn't look like he's going to get a job. Maybe he gets a job now because Ben Johnson ended up pulling his name out of the list. But I don't know because we just got word here. That Seattle's head coaching job has been filled. Mm. Uh, they are hiring the youngest head coach cool. in the NFL. If my stuff could load up here, keep me. Hey, I'm trying to. Who is it? I'm about to go. 
about to go to Mike the McDonald is going to be the next head coach oh, the Ravens. The Ravens. from the DC from the Ravens is going to be the next head coach of the Seattle Seahawks. I'm not mad at that. 36 years old. He's the ninth head coach wow. in the franchise's history. That is per Diana Rossini of the athletic shout out to Diana Rossini always doing great work over there. So that's a job that's filled. Washington's the only job left. That means Belichick will not have a head coaching job this season. There's an NFL without Bill Belichick in it, ladies and gentlemen, and Ben Johnson's still available next season because he's going back with the lions. So if this does all go nuclear and I'll say this, even to this, I, I think we see this a lot less in the NFL, but if things don't work out with flutes, right? And this is just keeping all the doors open how Ryan Poles has. Shane Waldron was a guy who was believed that could be a possible head coach in this NFL. Thomas Brown was an assistant head coach in this NFL. Eric Washington was an assistant head coach in this NFL. You've possibly got three head coaching candidates on your roster currently. You are setting yourself up to have so many different options next season. And I'm going to be real with you. And I, I, I've said this on the breeze many a times. I'll say it here. I don't know. I got the graphic in here. Here it is. Here it is. I, it, yeah. Impose we trust. You know what I mean? Impose we trust. Get the buttons made up. Get whatever you got to do. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I don't know why he's – I, I keep asking my producer that made it. I'm like, why is he licking his lips? He's like, it's the only side profile, bro. I'm going to tell you this, right? We have we have no choice but to trust in <laughs> Poles. What are you talking about? Like, I, I get it, and I love the graphic, and I always talk, I always say, hey, let Poles cook, and I yeah. put the chef hat on him, you know what I'm saying, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we have no choice. It's his decision. Like, who cares? He, who, despite how much we argue back and forth here in Chicago, we want Williams, we want, we want Fields, we want uh, whatever. It's his choice. He it's wants me. Wait a minute. Hold on now. <laughs> he's about to trust and pose. And, you know, to say that, he's he's done – I mean, he's done a great job so far. I mean, look yeah. at the situation we're in. Like, he's done a great job so far. So we have to trust and pose. But he's given us reasons to trust him because of the way that we're set up right now. Okay? So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you, man. You know, pose we trust. Let, let, let Chef Pose cook. Let him, let him pick the right ingredients. You know what I'm saying? The grocery store looks good in terms of the draft. You got some things there, man. We've got, got, hey, we've got money. We can go. Hey, we can go to the grocery store. We can, you know, we can pick. We're set up to pick what we want. And hey, we, listen, we, we that's, 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 when, man. that's when you're most dangerous. That's yeah. when you're most dangerous. You know, and I think here's the thing about polls, right? Using the grocery store analogy, he's going in with a list. He's yeah. more disciplined, right? Sometimes yeah. you go into the grocery store, you got an extra two hundred dollars in your pocket, and what you doing? You throwing the ho hos in there. Yeah. You got the zebra cakes. Yeah. You got the uncrustables. Yeah. I mean, hey, fire! A shout out uncrustables. If y'all ever want to sponsor, I yeah, rock with y'all. Yeah. You know what I mean, come on now. But yeah, you, know, you right. filling it up with junk. You got all this stuff, and then you get home, and you like, wait a minute. I didn't get no chicken. <laughs> but what you know, I'm eating for dinner. It don't matter. When you have money and you forget an ingredient, well, guess what? I don't feel like going back to the store. I'm ca- I'm calling Instacart. Instacart, yeah. you want to sponsor. Instacart, if you feel like sponsoring, go ahead. But I'm calling Instacart. <laughs> pick up the chicken. And and you have you have you have the funds. We're not shopping on a budget. Yeah. We have money. So I can yeah. go in there and I can go buy the filet and I don't have to buy the skirt steak. I can go get the filet because we got money. And the reason why we have money, we have capital is because Pose has put us in the situations to have that along with that in pieces. So, I mean, like I said, we're set up, but we got to get it right. Yeah. We haven't gotten it right. We have not gotten it right. You know, and, 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 and I'm saying, you know, I, and when I mean, when I say getting it right is, They've got to come up with the ultimate decision, right? First and foremost, the biggest decision that everybody's been talking about, not just here in Chicago, but everywhere, the decision at quarterback, right? Something yeah. that you haven't gotten right. Do you have it right with Justin Stank, with better coaches and a scheme and, and, and a system in place? Or do you go elsewhere and you find the right guy in the draft who you feel, you know, can 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 take the helm and, and really become that franchise quarterback? Something that we haven't had here in Chicago. Yeah, you got to get it right one way or another. It's got to be right. A hundred percent. And this is this is the time where I said this. This is your next five to ten years of franchise success is based on this offseason to me. 
Yeah. Like I think I think if you make the wrong decision, you got to think about it. If you make the wrong decision at quarterback, you're tied with that decision at least two years if you go Justin, at least three years if you go Caleb, right, or Drake May or whoever that guy may be. If you make the wrong decision there, uh, what what's your future at quarterback looking like? That's going to determine where your franchise goes. If you go with Justin and maybe build out the rest of the team. Maybe you have a little bit more of a window to have a little wiggle room there. If you go with Caleb and you make trades for Justin, but you don't have as much draft capital to build out the rest of that team and you go with the money. Now you're tied up money wise coming towards it. Right. So you have to make so many of the right decisions this off season, Like you've said, where this is, this is the, the put up or shut up time. I almost said the other one. This is, this is the put up or shut up time here. Uh, for Ryan Poles. And and I think based on even like decisions like this, when I'm talking about the coaching decision, Ben Johnson staying in, in and having that option next year still, that to me are the, dis- those to me are the decisions where you go, I'm not disrupting anything that we have here just in case there is something. Mm-hmm. But I have so many options going into next season that I can make the right move if this one wasn't. And I think that's the one thing about Ryan Poles that I've respected so much. There's always been the the confidence to go out and make a move. But if this ain't the right move, I'm not destroying our franchise by making this move. Yeah. That's the part I want to see more of. I love that. I absolutely love what the Bears are doing here. I think they're doing some good things. I'm excited about this upcoming season. I think they're going to take more of a jump than probably what most fans think they're going to take going into next season. I don't know if it'll be a jump with uh, the two teams we got in the Super Bowl, though. I don't know if we'll be that big of a jump, but I do want to talk about those teams because I think that that kind of comes back to this Bears conversation. When you talk about how do you build your team, yeah, you have one team where basically, and I don't want to say it's the Caleb Williams route, right, but you have the generational quarterback. That's what he's touted to be. By the way, a generation is 20 years, guys. I don't know if y'all know that or not. Like, we got our generational guy. He's playing oh, in the Super Bowl. Use the word too loosely. No, oh, too loosely, bro. It irritates <laughs> my soul. Everybody's a goat now, right? Every everybody's generational talent. Like, I mean, and you're a basketball guy too, Pat. And I'll say this, right? So last night I'm watching like NBA Live, about to watch some basketball games. Right? Yeah. I think uh, Jason Kidd came out and said that. I know you heard it. Said that uh, that Luca was better than uh, Dirk already, and I'm just like, wow, like. I mean, they're played a while now. Like, I get it. Luca's awesome. Luca's a great score. But everybody's a goat, though. Everybody. Like, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, let us like, let his career play. He can. I mean, I, and next year he can go out there and only average five points a game. Who knows? Yeah. But he, I mean, you see what I'm saying? Like, we just use that word too loosely. And I think we, we. It's it's tough, right? Because not to say I think Luca skill wise is probably better than Dirk is long term. But mm-hmm. when you look at everything, it's tough because you uh, even with football a lot, you forget because every single team wasn't on your TV every single day. I watch the Dallas Mavericks almost every other day. Yeah, I mean, like I, I really do. Like, yeah, you know I mean, like I like the team that they have. I, I can watch whatever basketball team I want every single day. Growing up, I can watch every. I watched almost every football game this year. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I watch every red zone moment every single week. So because of that, I have more of a recollection of what I'm seeing right as it's happening versus having the, I saw the Dallas, man. Now, Jason Kidd, very different, right? Jason Kidd played with Dirk, won a championship with Dirk. So he's seeing him on a different level. But I I feel like a lot of people are going to be inclined to just go out and agree with that because... Oh well, I didn't. I don't remember Dirk doing this. Right. I don't. Well, you weren't watching Dirk play the Charlotte Hornets on a Tuesday night right. back in the day. You was watching Dirk play the Lakers in the playoffs. That's all you had. Yeah, I mean, so and um, another thing too, Pat. Like you know, and you know, I know we went off on the tangent, but to talk about you know, you talk about the generational quarterback like Patrick yeah. Mahomes and stuff like that. Like, I think another question that that needs to be raised in terms of like you know Patrick Mahomes, right? You go to Kansas City. You're there with Andy Reid, man. A generational coach. I played for Coach Reid my rookie year. Yeah. And, like, I was blown away back then. And he's only gotten better each and every year. Like, I mean, like, would Patrick Mahomes be Patrick Mahomes if he didn't land in Kansas City under Coach Reid? You see what I'm saying? So, I get it. I get it. Like, Patrick Mahomes, phenomenal quarterback, has, 
you know, an, a worldly talent. I mean, it's it's amazing what he's done with with the with you know the receiving core that, that he's had this year. It's crazy how they turn that thing around where you know they were leading the league in drops at one point. Everybody's still questioning the Kansas City Chiefs and what happens. Yeah. You know, Patty Mahomes has has him right back in the Super Bowl, right? But it's not just Patrick Mahomes, man. Let's give credit to Andy Reid now. I mean, like you lose Eric Bieniemy and you're still in the Super Bowl. You know what I'm saying? Like you're losing high level. Like, come on now. Like, like Andy yeah. Reid is a dog as a coach. I've been around well, him. I've think- been in those meetings. I've been in those installs. And this was a long time ago. But it, it, it's just, I mean, he's he's a dog. So I, I get it. But, you know, I, I, I think Patrick Mahomes is phenomenal. You know, he, he, is, he is a generational talent. That's for sure. But when you pair a generational talent with a competent, established, accredited, a head coach that is, you know, we talk about the other coaching trees. I mean, Andy Reid has a coaching tree. Yeah. Like my, my He's got year, a legitimate coaching tree. Yes. My rookie year, man, and, and I think I, I tweeted this out the other day, like my rookie year in Philadelphia, Pat, John Harbaugh was a special mm-hmm. teams coach. Dave Tobe, who's a Kansas City Chiefs special teams coach right now, was the assistant special teams coach. Sean McDermott was a defensive quality control coach. You yep. know what that means? Like, it means he gets together all the playbooks and stuff like that at that time. That was That's how long ago that was. Leslie Frazier was the DB coach. Ron Rivera was a linebacker coach. Brad yeah. Childress, who was the head coach of the Vikings, was the OC. Like, I mean, we it goes on and on. I mean, it's, it's, you know what I'm saying? Like, Juan Castillo was the offensive line coach, been offensive line coach in the league for a long time. Like, like Andy Reid's developed some coaches, man. Yeah. Like, I mean, dude, like, so it's, do you, do you want to take that generational quarterback if he's there, especially if you don't have one? Yeah. But that talent, despite him having all that talent, and, and the ability to do things that other quarterbacks can't do, things that we haven't seen, you still got to have that coach to put him in position to make sure that talent's on display, but also to make sure he's in a position to be successful. Here's the thing that I find interesting, and our own Shay Norling did some math uh, uh, this weekend going through all 67 starting QBs by draft position that have played in a Super Bowl. number one overall, 20% day three, uh, 17% were drafted second through uh, the second pick through the 10th pick, 15% were 11 through 32, 13% were round three guys, 11% were two uh, around two guys and 4% were undrafted. I think if I'm not mistaken, though, I want to say four of those first overall pick guys didn't end up winning with their own teams. I I haven't done as much math, but here's my question to everybody out there. Mm -hmm. We talk about generational quarterbacks. How do you build a generational quarterback? And I think that's the part people don't look at, right? You think about Tom Brady. Tom Brady is our previous generational quarterback now going into Patrick Mahomes. Tom Brady wasn't generational when he started. Tom Brady wasn't generational in that first Super Bowl. You know what he was generational at? Handing the football to the dudes that was running it behind him. He was generational at being a part of the game plan. He turned into Tom Brady as he was able to develop in a system that nurtured building the quarterback. To me, that's what the Bears need to build here. And that's why I say, right, like I think a lot of us think the Kansas City situation is different from the San Francisco situation where they were drafted is different. The situation the quarterbacks developed in was not that was an AFC championship team uh, uh, that uh, that Patrick Mahomes inherited. He got on the field. Yeah, he turned him into a Super Bowl team. Hundred percent. No slight to him. I do believe talent wise, he is one of the most amazing quarterbacks that I have ever seen. But he stepped into an AFC championship team that had Tyreek Hill that had Travis Kelsey, that had an offensive line in place, that had a running game ready to go, that had the Honey Badger on it, right? That team, now, he's been able to continue to develop through that, and now that the offense isn't good, he's the generational piece that continues to get the team over the hump with Travis Kelsey because they've been able to build that up while the offense was elite. Now your defense is making plays, and we look at Patty Mahomes, and we're like, just go out there and make magic. He can do that now. Brock Purdy's in that situation right now. 
He's in a Super Bowl in his second season. Yes, drafted in very different spots. That right. offensive line is elite. That running game's elite. The receivers are elite. You've got a defense that's going to put you in really good positions and help you out a ton. Like, those are the things to me that nurture quarterback play. And I think that's the part when I look at these numbers and you see how many di- – I mean, like, th- I would say the first three. 20% number one overall picks, 20% day three picks, 17% two through 10. That basically means you can find a quarterback anywhere in the draft if you have the situation where that quarterback can be developed. In. Right, and you have in, in the common denominator, common denominator between both these teams that are in the Super Bowl, right? They've got elite head coaches with great offensive minds. You see what I'm saying? That's yeah. developing quarterbacks, but also – put their quarterbacks in situations to be successful, right? Despite all the weapons that the 49ers have, that offensive scheme, right, is tailored to make to, to enable the quarterback to be successful regardless of what the skill what his skill set is. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Same thing with Kansas City. Like you have a coach who can he can adapt his offense towards his quarterback skill sets, right? Alex Smith was successful in Kansas City before Patrick Mahomes took over. Why? Because Andy Reid, two different skill sets between Patrick Mahomes and Alex Smith. But guess what? You have a great offensive-minded head coach that can tailor his system, that understands how to make the adjustment to make whatever quarterback under center, whatever quarterback is under center, and make them successful. Yeah. See what I'm saying? And when you have when you have that ability as a coach to be able to do that, but then as and you have that player that has the talent that a lot of people haven't seen, well, guess what? You get a, a, a team that's consistently winning. That's always going to be in the conversation, despite who's out there at receiver, despite who's there at the offensive line, despite the questions that you have about defense. Well, guess what? The thing that remains constant is you have a head coach that's going to get the most out of his players. That's always going to have his organization. Uh, he's always going to have his organization, you know, always ready. They're always going to have a competitive edge because you have that type of, of head coach that has a type of track record and understands what success looks like. But now you have a generational quarterback yeah. leading the charge. So now you're always going to be in the conversation in terms of the playoffs, Super Bowl, year in the year, because you have those those things in place, right? And the other side with the 49ers, we see an offense that's gone from Garoppolo, right, that's been successful. Now you, you throw in a guy, you got Purdy, he's in there having success, right? Well, guess what? You have a, a young offensive-minded head coach that's always going to he ha- he has a system that despite who's under center yeah. is going is going to be success there despite all way and the throwing you've got what you you drafted well you've gotten it right a lot of times you got it right with Debo Samuels you got it right with the trade with Christian McCaffrey you've been getting it right and you and you combine that with the offense the system the coach that you have well guess what now you see why these two teams are in the Super Bowl because they're yeah. getting it right and they know what it wins they know what uh, what it takes to win consistently they understand what having, you know, uh, consistent success is. They understand it. Yeah, and I guess the question now for the Bears is, is it too late? Because the one thing that I will say about, I think both of these guys, right? Neither situation was built for them. The team stumbled into them. The situation was built for, for Alex Smith to go to the Super Bowl. Alex Smith didn't go to the Super Bowl. He was a game manager, check down kind of guy. Okay, we're going to get through here. We're going to get through the game. We find Pat Mahomes and and Matt Nagy basically says, this guy is Jesus Christ with a football. We need to find a way to draft him. Somebody's got to convince Coach Reed that I'm right on this. He was right, right? You're right. And now you put the quarterback in that didn't have to go through the bumps and bruises while you were building that team, and he's able to hit the ground running. Purdy kind of same situation. Team was built for Garoppolo. Yeah. Garoppolo just couldn't stay on the field. They realized, okay, this dude's too injury prone. We can't go out here and consistently win with him. They go Trey Lance. They go high draft pick. They get Trey Lance in there. They're still building a team around Trey, and Trey can't stay on the field. They go through, what, four quarterbacks last season until they land on Purdy. And then Purdy's like, wait, so you just want me to throw the football to Debo Samuel? That's all you asking me to do right now? You want me to give it to Christian McCaffrey? I bet I could do this all day. Yeah, and it's not to say Purdy's not making plays, but he came into something that was built for him. I guess the question is, is Justin going to be the beneficiary of this, or is he our version of Alex Smith? Is he our version of uh, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo where 
the next guy is going to be the guy that's probably going to benefit from the team building things up while you were the one that took all the shots. Yeah, and, you know, we talked about, right, we talked about Coach Kerry Joseph, the new quarterback coach here in Chicago, right, talking about swag, talking about a quarterback having to have that swag, right, and that swag equals, equals confidence. So when you look at Brock Purdy, yes, you have the weapons around him to make him feel comfortable, right? By the way, no swag. No, yeah, no, no swag with Purdy. But here's, where, here's where I'm going with it, though, right? So initially, initially, I'd say he has no swag, right? I'm not yeah. talking about the wristbands and the way he's taped up and the way he wears his jersey. Yeah. I'm talking about swag in terms of his confidence, right? So you, you bring a young guy in there who, you know, initially any quarterback, you go in a situation, you're going to be like a deer in headlights. And, yeah. you know, the stage too big. You go out there and, bam, you've got all these weapons around you to help you gain that swag, to help you gain that confidence, right? But what happens, right? The more passes you complete to Debo, to, to Kittle, right? The more big plays that, that Christian McCaffrey makes, well, guess what? The more confident I'm getting as a quarterback, right? Then I start making plays on my own. Something yeah. we saw last weekend, right? You see Brad Purdy scrambling for first down. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, bro. Brad Purdy's <laughs> running? Now. Bro, that bro had no swag. Hey, the, hey, the running form, the way he was, had no swag, the way he was running. <laughs> it was swagger less. Yeah, he looked like he was a... Yeah, <laughs> you look like Forrest Gump running the ball. Like that's how Forrest Gump was running. But run, Forrest, run! <laughs> but but the confidence and the swag, right? It starts it starts going it starts trending upward, right? Because yeah, yeah. Now he's confident in saying, you know what? Damn, like I can play. I can play. Like I, I not just I have weapons around me, but I can make plays in this league. Yeah, I can make plays in this. So what happens? He starts becoming the reason why. The 49ers are winning games. He's a big part of the reason why the 49ers came back and, and beat Detroit. Now, Dan Campbell's a big reason to, reason why, too. But at the same time, Brock Purdy, you know, he made some plays in that game. And he's made plays throughout this season, right, that that he's been the reason why the 49ers has, have had success, right? Now he's one of those weapons. You have a weapon at quarterback now that's been developed, that had the game swag, that had the game confidence, and now he's going out there making plays. So yeah. it's and it's because you have a coach that understands that hey you know what I've got to make my system uh, and I say everybody says quarterback friendly but I've got to make it you know effective to where whatever quarterback we have under center this thing will, this thing will keep going because of what we're running our skim, uh, the way we, our run game is the way our run and pass is married together you look at the 49ers, I mean look at their offense that's the model of marrying the run and pass I mean that's yeah. It's phenomenal. You know what I'm saying? But he understands how to get the most out of his quarterback and how to how to enable them to gain that swag, to gain that confidence. So that way they can go out there and still produce. So that way if something happens, it's not over. It's like, oh, man, our season's over. No, no. Season's still going. Whoever's who, whoever's up, ne up next has to step in and make, you know, the same plays. They have to continue to run this offense. And, you know, the 49ers, they've gotten it right. Just like you said, they've gotten it right. They stumbled in. You got it right. Yeah, and to me, that's that's put in the, the the one thing that I think we haven't done here, even with Justin, I'd say even with Tyson Bajic getting in there, right? Like, mm -hmm. th there hasn't been a building of confidence with the quarterbacks that we've had here, even with Mitch, right? When when he messed up, I'm taking things away. It's not, hey, you're you're okay to make mistakes. Go out, you're a young guy, you got to figure this out. Go out there, make mistakes. You're fine. Like, let's go. Like, I think that that is something that we've seen. The teams that have the elite quarterbacks do now. Not to say you know you can go out there and lose us every game by making so many mistakes, but don't be afraid to make plays because you're scared that there's going to be a mistake made. That's how I feel year two was for Justin. Everything was if it ain't there, I'm not letting it fly. But I'm sorry, year three because I'm I'm concerned that I might throw an interception here, right? Like uh, even Beja, right? We saw Beja in that Saints game; he was letting it fly. The next game, he was just like turn around, hand it off. Nope. Uh, Kill, kill. Nope. <laughs> Hand it off. Yep. That little five yeah. yard. That right. Like, and I feel like that was one of the things that gets he did. He didn't instill confidence in his quarterback. He kind of took the confidence away from them a little bit. And it's now hopefully we see a difference here with what we have now. I think we got some good coaches in the building. I'm excited about what we have. The one thing I will say as well, you mentioned another term. There's two terms I want to get out of the get the sports talk game. It's please stop making everybody generational. Yeah. And stop saying quarterback friendly system. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. What? Who wants a quarterback unfriendly system? 
Yeah, you see how I broke it down, though. Quarterback, you got a, a quarterback effective, quarterback efficient. Like, yes, you know, yes. You know, I don't know. Like, it's, it's when I hear people go, Well, you know, he's running a quarterback friendly system. Oh, yeah, you want an unfriendly one. You want one where the quarterback right. has to run for his life and try not to die. That's, we got that. We we got that system for you. <laughs> right, right. And it's, you know, it just gets, it's just a, like we talked about before, right? When you, you look at the teams, right, that have had consistent success in this league. You have to look at what they're doing. Like you yeah. got to dissect what they're doing. Like what's the anatomy of the Kansas City Chiefs? You know what's the anatomy of the uh, the San Francisco 49ers? Like what are they doing? You know what I'm saying? And Andy Reid and Kyle Shanahan. <laughs> it starts at the top. Like it starts at the top. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah, yeah like a couple months ago, you know, we're like, man, Kansas City, they're done. Like Patrick Mahomes cussing the receivers out on the sideline. Mark, uh, M, M, uh, Dustin Nagy out on the sideline. <laughs> yeah, Stanley walk around like he ain't got no hands, like he walk around with just wrist because he can't catch the ball. You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, what happens? You know what I mean? Andy Reid clamps that thing down. You yeah. know, guys make some plays. They win some tough games. All of a sudden, the receiving core is starting to, un just starting to gain that confidence. They're out there making plays. And we have a head coach that always has that, like Andy Reid, he don't have swag on the sideline, but guess what? He's got swag in terms of confidence, in terms of his ability as a head coach. Yeah. Right. And you got Patrick Mahomes that has some swag. You know what I mean? Swag's a little weird, but he has some swag. But that's that confidence is still there that I'm the best quarterback in this damn league. So I have a coach that's always going to uh, keep us in games. And you have a quarterback that can change the game because of his ability. Well, guess what? Yeah. Now everybody around them believes the defense is playing better. Receivers are making catches. Guess what? We're right back in this damn Super Bowl. Hey, I'll tell you what. When you talk about swag, there's one thing that uh, Pat Mahomes Sr. did not pass on to his son. But he got that swag on the field. He's elite on the field. <laughs> that man is a – but, man, when you talk about – With his cigar? Did you hey. see that? Man, this is that Lamar Jackson blend. <laughs> he said we smoking on that Lamar tonight, baby. You eat smoking that Lamar. He looked like every lit uncle at the at the party, bro. I'm not gonna lie. Like that. Dad, can you please Dad, can you please just sit down somewhere? Dad, I mean, it's so funny because you see Pat Mahomes. Like when, when they got him mic'd up, every time I hear his voice, I'm just like, what's going on there, bro? Like, what? Like, what how did that not translate at all? I'm here. Stop playing with me. I'm in the game, baby. EA Sports. <laughs> like, what? He's saying, he's saying, he sounds like a, a a megaphone, like with one battery or something like that. Hey, it's man, he sounds like he's trying to figure out why there's so many songs about rainbows. Uh, yeah. Appreciate you guys for tuning in and showing love. Hit that like button. Subscribe to the page. Leave me and J-Mac just started frying people. Now. Like, not that. That's what the off-season pod is. It's just me and J-Mac. <laughs> We have episode. We're gonna put pictures up here. We're gonna start cracking on them for y'all. Oh, dog! We definitely got to do that. We got to get the worst, worst we'll outfits of the off season. The NBA is about to we'll provide us with so many good outfits, dog. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. Hit that like button, subscribe to the page, leave that five star review. Y'all know what to do as always. For Jason McKee, your boy Pat the Designer, back at it again. Bardon, y'all will be back tomorrow with Courtney Cronin. Y'all stay safe out there, Chicago. Peace.